Okay, so hi everybody and welcome back to another episode of Faith Brunel's Insights. I'm Faith Brunel and today we have Mark with us. Mark, how are you this evening? I'm brilliant, thank you very much. Wonderful, good. lovely. So Mark, I'm just going to hand over to you briefly before I then um, pop into my interview mode. Could you introduce yourself to the listeners for us, please? I'm Mark Robinson. I'm a criminal barrister and I am um, I practice out of a chambers called Garden Court in central London. I predominantly specialise in criminal defence and I represent um, people charged with um, serious criminal offences across the full spectrum mm -hmm. from um, drugs, firearms, serious violence, serious sexual assaults. Uh, and um, I've been um, doing it now. I've been a barrister for three years. Before that, I was a solicitor for all of six months <laughs> and yeah, that's kind of where I'm at with the, the legal side of things at least. Wonderful Mark thank you very much for quickly running us through your wonderful background as well I wasn't actually aware that you were a solicitor for six months and now you are now you've been a practicing barrister for three years so wonderful to see how you've kind of you know how you've kind of been able to navigate and find your place um, in terms of the legal profession and it's good that you did still stick within the legal profession it's just kind of a different role that you found that you feel more better suited to but let's get stuck into the questions to this evening so working in criminal law can be emotionally demanding how do you navigate the intense emotional terrain that, that often accompanies criminal cases um emotionally demanding i mean uh, it's going to sound bad. I think I'm kind of desensitised, you know. Mm. Nothing really bothers me. I do an awful lot of sexual um, offence cases. I've done yeah. rapes and everything just seems to bounce off me. I, I, I don't know, maybe I had an all, a, a traumatic childhood growing up. It was mm. awful. I grew up in care. Right. Um, I saw a lot of gang violence. Um, I, yeah, I've, had, I've sadly witnessed people killed in front of me. My le my best friend or close friend was lost to knife crime oh, gosh, so uh, over a decade ago, and so um, I've seen an awful lot. And I think it toughens you up. You know what yeah. doesn't kill you, you uh, doesn't kill make, doesn't it makes you stronger. And for that mm -hmm. reason, I think that it's kind of it's, uh, I come to the bar made of tougher stuff, tough yeah. metal, and so it doesn't bother me. I mean, to be fair, I had um, an RSPCA case from um, someone who they abused a puppy, and that mm -hmm. sickened me. So I. That it was finally, uh, it was yeah. something that finally got to me. I'm an animal yeah. lover. But beyond that, again, I I don't suffer that. But having said that, you know, you don't know how you absorb these things. Um, I do occasionally try to have counselling. And, and so you, you don't know what you, you build up. So I'm, uh, on the surface, it, it doesn't bother me. I don't feel it bothers me. But of course, you never, ever yeah. know what, what may be going on. Thank you, Mark. Very um, thank you, Mark, for your um, for your thoughts on this and your very honest account, really, um, and, and really sharing some personal stories and anecdotes as well. Um, yeah, and you know, I completely would understand. I completely understand what you're saying as well. Sometimes when when you see something so much, you do become desensitized to it, and sometimes you don't actually understand the extent to which something uh, or someone really has had an impact on us. So thank you for sharing that as well. And I'm very sorry that I said to, um, before to hear that your um, one of your close friends died because of knife crime. Knife crime for me is a passion of mine in terms of understanding and trying to reduce knife crime. It was actually my EPQ while I was uh, whilst I was studying at King Edward's um, in Stourbridge. Um, and knife crime was my EPQ because I was trying to understand what was the kind of socio and economic factors behind it and the political factors and looking at some of the legal factors as well. And it is something that I believe needs to be reduced. Uh, so thank you for for shedding some light on a very important topic. So just kind of, just kind of segueing back into your criminal law background, this obviously requires a very, you know, a very unique skill set. What advice do you have for aspiring barristers looking to develop and kind of work on the essential skills needed for success in this particular field? Uh, so look, if you're going into criminal law, I think undoubtedly you'll need a sense of empathy. Mm -hmm. Um you know these people from this background it, a lot of people are, are come from a traumatic past there is trauma mm -hmm. um for a greater or lesser scale um a lot of people don't it's just the, the life the circumstances low social economic factors are very yeah. important um again i saw a lot of that growing up so again i suppose it gives me a, a skill set where barristers who come from a more traditional middle class background mm -hmm. probably don't see growing up um, I'm not saying that they can't empathise with people's plights, but I think that's an important skill set. And, and also, I suppose, that being said, be yourself. The, the, the bar, 
has changed somewhat. Uh, it's yeah. still an elitist profession. It's still difficult to get in. But once you do, you do get in, especially at the criminal bar, I think where you're from in terms of class wise, is not it's not so important as maybe it once was. Yeah. So don't try to pretend to start talking with a plummy accent mm. and 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 everything. Just be yourself. I do. It works for me, and I've I've managed to build a successful practice just be, by being me. Yeah, wonderful, Mark. Those are some wonderful words of wisdom there. To be yourself, be confident in who you are, and and, and ultimately be confident in kind of what you offer and bring to the table as well as an aspiring barrister, um, as well and as a barrister. So thank you very much for that kind of honest um honest deep dive and reflection on that question, which really kind of leads me into my next question you know talking a little bit more in depth about the legal landscape and how it's really constantly evolving so could you shed some light on how recent changes in criminal law have, uh, firstly impacted your work and secondly what strategies have you employed in order to adapt with oh sorry i've lost you there oh sorry <laughs> Um, so let me just reiterate. So the question was talking about the legal landscape um, and how it's constantly evolving. So first of all, could you shed some light on how recent changes in criminal law have impacted your work? And, set to, and secondly, what kind of like what kind of methods and strategies have you actually implemented in order to kind of to move forward and deal with these changes? Well, look, two changes to, uh, that spring to mind. Mm -hmm. Uh, one will be a um a interesting development um due to the date the king's speech and opening of parliament where those that have committed sex offenders sex offenses but uh, um expressly rapists mm -hmm. um would be expected to serve the whole term of their sentence mm -hmm. and not come out of license um i've yet to see the details but i do have a case though, of those kind of offenses and of course, where people would expect to come out at the halfway mm -hmm. or two thirds, that is Strange. probably not going to be possible anymore as of whenever it goes through Parliament. So that will be interesting. But in mm -hmm. terms of things and what I've implemented, all right. So when I, before I came into the profession, yeah. was post COVID, I qualified bang in the middle of COVID. Wow. So the use of CVP is, is embraced a lot more. What that means is that I can log into a court on the other side of the country and I've gone as far as, um, I think somewhere up by Newcastle, there was a court there mm -hmm. that I did once and I've done Swansea as well, all remotely. Places which would have taken me the entire day to get to for a mention where, quite frankly, it would have cost me more money mm -hmm. to get there than what I was actually getting paid for the hearing. Yeah. That has changed. It's helpful. So how I'm joining you today with this podcast, mm -hmm. it's the same yeah. thing. I've got, I use my headset. I, I log in. But admittedly, they expect us to wear our wigs and gowns. Um, obviously, with, when I do wear my headset, it's impossible to wear a wig. And I would look quite silly if this mm -hmm. is on top of my head. However, um, <laughs> yeah, it, it's really something of use. And as so that is the legal landscape, it's changed the use of technology. Mm -hmm. Um we are still expected to go into some things in person, but it's balanced itself out and, and, and more and more judges are being more and more reasonable yeah. and allowing that. Of course, you still have to do trials mm -hmm. in a traditional way. There's going to be a jury present. Having said that, um, there was a trial that I did recently where I was sick, a couple of them, mm -hmm. and the judge um, has allowed me to log in. One was, yeah, I was sick for about four days during the course of a rather lengthy trial. Yeah. And I was sick. The judge allowed me to log in from home. Mm -hmm. And and then and even, albeit the client was unfit to stand trial anyway, so I didn't have right. the client's protect. Out, yeah. and, and then another trial I had the other day in Birmingham, and the last day of the trial, when the jury went out, the judge allowed me to log in. And as and when there was a verdict, he allowed yeah. me to log in via CV people. So I had other matters to deal with in other parts of the country. So I, I went, I returned home. So that it, it can be, it's a, it's a good thing. Yeah, positive um, changes. And, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's one of the main things I'd say. Well, thank you, Mark, as well. Clearly, as we just said, there are positive changes that really kind of had a grave impact on the kind of the flexibility of, of the role. You know, as being a practicing barrister, as you said, you gave, you know, you gave many good examples of where before it would have cost you, um, you know, a certain amount. But now, because of the post-COVID, um, the kind of the technology that has um, arisen and developed um, has been strengthened because of COVID. And, you know, I can definitely relate. I remember when I first started reading Politics at King's, that was in 2020, mid-pandemic, 
And so I actually had two weeks of, of in-person classes. And then I, I was back in Birmingham while sitting at London University online. So that was my reality. So then it was kind of that integration post uh, year one, the first year, coming back in the second year with it all being in person. So as I said, you know, COVID really, you know, obviously had it, it, it had its disadvantages. But on the flip side, it did have advantages such as the technological advancements that we wouldn't have actually had if COVID hadn't existed. Now, just for those who aren't aware, what does the um, what was the acronym CVP stand for? So that's Court uh, v v Virtual Platform. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Well, <laughs> In the case anyone, I hope it's I <laughs> hope it's Court Virtual Platform. <laughs> It's the moment of truth now. If it's not, not don't worry, just forgive us. I've, I've just always been calling it CVP. <laughs> One would assume it's called virtual yeah. platform. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, if it's not, don't worry, everybody. It still exists. It might just be um, spelled yeah. out in a different way, but CVP does exist and it is beneficial to the barristers. Um, so just finally, really, cross-examining some witnesses, where, um, you know, cross-examining witnesses is a pivotal aspect of your role. And um, what is your secret to effective and persuasive cross-examination in the high-pressure environment of a courtroom? Um, so effective cross-examination, I mean, it it d depends on the case. Mm -hmm. There's some cases where I would go in on, on the offensive straight off the bat. Mm -hmm. Um and and, it, and so that depends on what what the defense is. Mm -hmm. If someone's blatantly lying, if they're of bad character. I might go in the offensive. Sometimes, um, if it's someone who's, um, you, you, you know, the, your defense is somewhat, you, you know, not the best. Mm. If it's something where the witnesses are somewhat vulnerable, or um, you may want to handle it with care. With care yeah. and, and again, and and don't go on the offensive. And so, in those circumstances, rather than outright saying someone's lying, I'd mm -hmm. probably say, look that maybe you've been mistaken do you know what I mean be, be yeah. polite and you know not be horrible to them you know almost like a conversation I put my client's case in a way where um it, it's just a mistake and it's all very civilized and polite it depends you know and case by case and there's some barristers that prefer to go in for the attack all the time as there are others that get their point across being very soft I'm a person, I like a, a wide range of, of things in my arsenal and I deal with every case, case by case, depending on the nature of the offence, yeah. depending on what it is, is is how you'll get me. I, I think it's important to be articulate and and, and, and to be, um, you know, able to deal with the, the, the situations as they arise. So there, there's no hard, far, hard or fast rule for cross-examination. Of course, there are rules. Yeah. Um, with it within it but of course when you get there and you've gone past those rules it's mm -hmm. down to the style of the advocate yeah thank you very much um mark as well for kind of talking about your personal experiences as you said it's about the style of the advocate as well and obviously as you mentioned there are those kind of that there are those kind of standard and set rules of engagement but it's about then you know as an advocate how you would then kind of use those rules of engagement to kind of get your point across and to cross-examine those witnesses as well so just finally before we actually kind of um, close this episode today how can the listeners get in contact with you after the show is over if you love my background, I'm on top of the world right now. So, <laughs> uh, like, if you, if if the if if this is being broadcast live, you can see that I'm on a place outside Earth. But generally, for all people that are on the planet Earth, um, I'd advise LinkedIn. So it's Mark Robinson LinkedIn. I've got loads and loads of followers, so that's a great place. And if you if people do message me, I always try to respond to my messages. And also, I've got Instagram as well, which is Mark Barrister seventy seven. And so that's that's for the kind of stuff that I can't I, I can't put on LinkedIn. Yeah. But but you can have more of a great insight of my life, but not too much insight. But just a little bit. <laughs> yeah, you're still private, but you're more um, open and public. Yeah, yeah, it's, it, yeah. It makes yeah. sense because LinkedIn is that professional, um, you know, workplace environment. So you wouldn't share everything with your colleagues, but if your friends following you on Instagram, you obviously share a bit more. So thank you, Mark, for giving us a little taste there about how the listeners can get in touch with you. It really depends on how much they want to know which platform they choose. Um, so if you do get an influx of followers on Instagram, it's probably from the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> and they want to, you know, and they want to have a deep dive into your life as an amazing barrister who's really kind of dealing with these cases and making a real impact. So thank you to everybody. First of all, thank you to 
Dr. Mark Robinson for appearing on the Faith and Other Insights podcast. Thank you to my listeners who come back week after week for um for an insight and you know for FBI to be their gateway to academic success. So without further ado, remember it's not an event, it's a journey. Your journey can begin now. This is your host, Faith Brunel, and I'm signing off. Goodbye. <laughs>